This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for Flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, as always, I'm Dan here with Matt, and this is the 100-point edition of the podcast. I don't really know what that means, but it sounds good. Uh, For the first time since the 2005-2006 season, the Flames have 100 points, and the season's not done yet. Uh, Matt, what do you think? We knew this was going to be a good season for the Flames going into this. Did you think they were going to get 100 points? Yes, I did. Um, At least we don't have to worry about facing Anaheim in the first round, you know, like that year. So hopefully the Flames can have a little bit better success after having such an excellent season. And frankly, the team's on pace to become the second best team in franchise history. Uh, The second best point total in Flames history is 105 points. And the Flames have seven games remaining, including a game going on tonight as we're recording. So we should be closing in on that fairly soon. Possibly even by the time we record next. I think it's funny that the Flames, they're selling this like $200 book thing you can buy with all the Flames history in it. I'm thinking to myself, you're asking fans to buy a $200 book to commemorate the team, and you're selling it in what's probably the second most important season for this team. Sell it next year. I know, exactly. And it's just unfortunate timing. I think whoever buys that book should have like an addendum booklet they'll send you a free insert yeah well let's uh let's break down the last week of games shall we flames started the week at home uh, against columbus and this is a game you and i weren't 100 percent sure what we might see from the team but we all thought they would win and the flames got a big win here four to two over columbus um riddick made 31 saves and goudreau scores his 35th goal for calgary this season you give your overall thoughts and then i'll go through my notes well, Calgary needed to show that they could beat a team who was desperate. And Columbus is fighting for their playoff lives. Uh, they're in a dogfight for the second wild card spot, and they're trying desperately to be the first wild card, or even just staying in the playoffs, especially after going all in. And they brought it in this game. And they were giving it their all, and Calgary's like, oh, okay, and just easily went on to win the game. And that's an important thing for this team, because you look at when the playoffs happen, you're going to be playing teams that are desperate to stay alive, because Calgary is the team to beat, and will be the team to beat. And that sounds so weird saying that about the Calgary Flames, but, you know, it is what it is. And they have to, they've never really been in this situation since 2005. And it's good for them to get some experience during the regular season of this is the type of game that you're going to be seeing from the opposition in the playoffs. Because you're better than them and they're just trying to stay alive. And they put their foot down and just beat them anyway. And that this was a true bellwether game for the team in showing themselves that when the going gets tough, they don't have to just fade away. They can just easily handle the opposition. And to their credit, they easily dismantled the Blue Jackets despite them throwing everything they had at us. I think another interesting thing to note here is that we were without two of our top players, no Monaghan and no Bennett in this game. Um, in the second period, we saw number 55, Noah Hannafin, get that puck to the face, and he was out for most of the period. So, you know, we had a lot of guys either out of the lineup or out of the lineup for a while, and that really is impressive that they were able to win 4-2 to two because of that. I agree, and I was relieved when Hannafin came back because that sure did look scary when... 
Riddick came flying out of the crease to make sure he was okay. Yeah, it did. You know, kind of what you were saying earlier, I had in my notes here, I thought the Flames played better hockey than Columbus, and that's why they won. They usually play down to their opponents, and I felt like they did that a little bit in this game, but they played good enough hockey to win, but kind of conserve their energy at the same time playing against a Columbus team. They played to where they had to be to win. Exactly, and they they managed the game well, and that's something that they haven't really had the ability to do frankly and where they're just completely better than the opposition and okay we can push but only to this extent because that's all that's necessary and they were able to manage the games better i think all three of them they managed the games better where they gave enough to win but they didn't have to go all out of the three of them, I thought this game didn't have much flow to it. The Flames didn't get their first shot in this one until 13-12 on the clock in the first. And it just, I don't know, it didn't have a lot of flow. The Flames were way too loose in their own end. And I thought they could let Columbus have too many good chances in front. So I think they played a good offensive game, but there was a lot to be desired in their own end in this one, in my opinion. Well, and that's the thing. that Columbus was desperate, and... The Flames are like, okay, yeah, you're going to come at us, so bring it, and we'll, let's see what you got. And they just weathered the storm until Columbus burned themselves out. And, okay, now it's our turn. And took it to them instead. And, it, of course, you don't like to see a stretch at the beginning of the game like that where you go 13 minutes without a shot, but... They were able to just take it easy, let Columbus, you know, keep them to the outside by and large, and Riddick made a number of good saves. Just, you know, managing the game. Riddick. Riddick's post in this game made a lot of good saves. He had probably True. Four, four of them saved by the post. We even saw him kiss the post at one point. I was kind of watching the ice after the game, see so if he was going to go and get married to that same post. Well, it, you know, sometimes uh, the post is the goalie's best friend, and in this one it definitely was. And I also, I think this was a pretty physical game as well. More physical than I was expecting for a game against Columbus, especially in the third period. A lot of, uh, a lot of chippy stuff, a lot of stuff after the whistle. It really felt like a playoff game. Yeah, and that's to be expected with the where Columbus is in the standings and how desperate they are they needed to be ready to go and of course you, anytime you have a team coached by Tortorella you're gonna have that kind of uh atmosphere well I have some uh, audio from the dressing room after this game when I was down there talking to the players so let's cut to that now and then we'll come back and talk Ottawa the Flames captain Mark Giordano gives his overall thoughts on this game uh first period was great uh I thought we, we didn't start as well as we wanted to, but I thought as the period went on, we got better and better. And then to get up 3-1 was, was huge. And we had a little bit of everything, big saves. Um, and I thought in the third, they got some power plays, which generated some momentum for them and some zone time. But uh, some big blocks tonight, some big saves by Ritter. I thought guys really dug deep and uh, played well. Number 67, Michael Froelich, scored with a pretty sweet dangle in that game. Here's him discussing that goal. Oh, it was just a uh, you know, nice play by Broach. I think I got some speed in the neutral zone, and uh, you know, I think we kind of got them a little caught, and uh, I kind of one on one, but uh, I just tried to take it to the net, and uh, you know, <laughs> went in, and uh, you know, it was, a, it was a big goal for us for sure. We talked about number 55, Noah Hannafin, getting hit in the head in that game, and that it was kind of scary. Here he is recalling what happened and how it felt. I don't know, I mean, he got me in like, the back of my helmet in the lower part, so it just felt like kind of a, a little bit of a flash or sting. It was pretty loud in my helmet, but um, like I said, thankfully it did hit my helmet and nowhere else, so um, it felt okay after a couple minutes. So I was a little, it was a little weird at first when I got hit. Um, a little bit of a sting in the back of my head, but um, I went to the locker room and um, they looked at it and uh, it felt okay after uh, probably like 10 minutes or so, and then I went back down. So. Head coach Bill Peters was asked about the push that Columbus put on in the third period and how his team responded to that and how that's sort of mimicking what playoff hockey might be like for these guys. Yeah, I thought they got momentum halfway through the game and kept it. I didn't think we ever got it back. And uh, they got momentum off their power play, obviously. They scored. 
in the third, and then they had the other opportunity halfway through the period. So I thought uh, they did a good job playing with some desperation, and uh, we had a hard time getting momentum back. All right, Matt. Uh, next game of the week was on Wednesday, and I think we both, I think everybody knew the Flames were going to win this one. They're taking on the team in the league that's probably worse than Edmonton, if it's possible, and that's the Ottawa Senators. And big five to one win against uh, against Ottawa here. Our, our Kachuk won the Battle of the Kachuks. Yeah, and there, there's not really too too much that you can say about this game. Ottawa is horrible. And the Flames did what the Flames would would and should do against a team like Ottawa. Like they're just horrible, and it, you know it's gonna be like four or five years before Ottawa sees the postseason again. I have a sneaking suspicion, not from anything I've heard, just my guess. I wouldn't be surprised if, in by the time Ottawa's good, they move to Quebec City. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me either. To be frank, I think with the unless they get a new local owner who will move the team downtown, I don't see that team staying in Ottawa, unfortunately, which is disappointing because it should be a good city to play. It's just that it their arena being out in the middle of nowhere and a moron for an owner, it, it there's not really much you can do, and you know it. I'm hoping that they can figure something out to fix the situation, but I don't see that situation being good with the owner as is. Me neither. Much in the same way with, with the Oilers, frankly. I don't see that situation turning around until they get a proper owner who's not a fan of the 80s Oilers teams. And who doesn't pay you in Rexall Drugs coupons and air miles? Yeah, or fires people via Skype. You know, or stupidity like that. Like, it's just, yeah. Well, not much to say about this Ottawa game. Should we move on to the next one? Yeah. it. We could pick on the Senators, but they've been through enough. You know what? It was a big Flames win. The Sea of Red went home happy. That's the important part. Yep. Uh, the next game, the, the Saturday night game, Calgary played Vancouver. We weren't really sure what to expect here. I think we, we didn't know how competitive Vancouver would be and how much Calgary would play down to them. And the big story of this one, I would say, is the depth scoring. Hathaway and Mangiapane both score in this one. That extends Mangiapane's uh, scoring to, I think, three games now in a row that he's scored in. Yeah. And Calgary gets a big 3-1 to one win here. Yeah, and if you count Giordano's goal being because of the fourth line being out there, all three came from the fourth line. And uh, that's... One of the luxuries of having a guy like Derek Smith in the organization and why I was a big proponent of that signing because he is... Darren Ryan? Uh, yeah, because he's such a very good depth piece that he w he's playing the way Stajan should have been playing. And not to slight Stajan at all, it's just that... You know, that's what we were kind of expecting from Stajan, and we're finally getting that high-quality center piece in the fourth line, and that allows guys like Mangipani and Hathaway some added room to do what they have to do on the ice, and everything seems to be clicking for that fourth line. And frankly, I think they're better than most teams' third lines. It's just that one of the weird things about this season we actually are an extremely deep team and our fourth line is very very good andrew mangiapani we know on the show you like to call him eat bread would you say this week he went into yeast mode yeah definitely yeast mode for the win um yeah i mean good to see him remember this is a guy who's a call-up a mid-season call-up and struggled to get started but it's like you open the floodgates and now he's doing a really good job well, yeah, and like some people were really concerned with him uh, not uh, having a goal in his first 27 games or whatever. And certain types of players struggle at the beginning of their career until they figure out the pacing levels at the NHL level. And then once things click, they go right. And he's been dynamite ever since then. Well, not to the been, NHL level. I think even you know when you're playing six, six, seven minutes a night, um, you got to figure out how to make the most of that time. There's a guy who in junior and even 
you know, for part of his time in Stockton, was used to playing big minutes. So I think it's probably partly, you know, okay, how do we make how do we make use of that little bit of time we're going to have on the ice? Yeah, and he's been since he started scoring, he's been on I do believe like a 50-point pace over 82 games. So like it he's been red hot for a fourth liner. So since far then. he's played 37 games, 7 goals, 4 assists for 11 total points. Yeah. And you have to remember the first batch of those games he didn't get any points so you know it he's been doing really well and if he can emerge as being a high-end third line player that might allow the flames if they need to to move out a player it if necessary in a trade to get an upgrade and like a guy like a sam bennett or something else further up the lineup to create room to allow Mangiapane to play at a higher level on the team. Or you keep everybody in, hey, awesome, you have four lines that are just awesome, but, you know, it it creates other opportunities when you have young guys like Eat Bread coming up and playing as well as they are. With the depth at forward that these guys have, I don't think you're going to see Mangiapane moving up and taking someone's spot anytime soon. I think that's going to be a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, but good game here. I thought it was a typical Calgary-Vancouver game. There was a lot of chippiness. There was a lot of guys. Um, I mean, we saw a lot of battle here. One guy I want to call out here was uh, James Neal. He was coming back. He hadn't played for, I think, 11 or 17 games. And didn't know what to expect, but he looked quite physical in this game. It was a side of James Neal that we normally don't see. Yeah, and I'm actually wondering a bit if he didn't have a couple of minor injuries that were just kind of nagging him all year because of the fact that he looked like himself instead of what we've seen this season. Because I've watched enough Penguins games and Stars games and Vegas games over the years to know what James Neal is, and he didn't look like that when what the way he's played for us all season. You know, with as much hockey as he's played, I think he might have just needed a rest. Yeah, and him getting the time off, uh, it should do him some... Well, uh, looking at his physical game, like if he can even just bring that, even if his scoring isn't doing well, it, especially in the postseason, like if he can be that Furland-ish type guy, that would be an excellent addition to the team, and hopefully he can chip in with some offense. But I also noticed in the game that he st started to like ease off a bit later in the game and I think that made sense too just for like the Flames didn't need to go all out to beat Vancouver so like there's no sense of him running around trying to maul people for no reason basically so use that energy better on the next team yeah looking at his stat line in this game he had one shot on goal two hits uh 12 12 of total ice time 39 seconds that came on the power play so easing him back in for sure he's on that third line and we'll it'll be interesting to see what we get from him in the next handful of games that we have left mm -hmm. well matt that wraps up this week um taking a look at where the flames are now in the standings We've been talking about how close we are with San Jose, and after those three wins, we finally built up some distance. Calgary's now at 101 points, as we mentioned at the top of the show, and San Jose's at 95. So we built up a six-point lead here. I've said it all month. I think that it's going to come down to that game against San Jose on the 31st to decide who's number one in the Pacific, um, and I'm hoping that we can build up at least another four, if not all six points between now and then. Well, the thing is that the Flames' magic number to clinch, I do believe, is only four. So a combination of four Flames wins and four Sharks losses uh, will clinch us the conference. And frankly, with some of the teams that San Jose is playing, uh, they have Vegas and us coming up next week, and then uh, the Flames, they play four games against 
uh, the two of the worst teams in the West uh, being LA and Anaheim, and as we well as the twice. game against the Oilers. So, you know, it we should be able to get four wins just from the weaker opponents, let alone uh, the game against San Jose and let alone what San Jose has to go through. So it's just, a ma it's one of those where a lot would have to go wrong for the Flames not to win the conference at this point, where San Jose basically has to win out and we have to lose out and... You know, that could happen, of course, but based on who we're playing, we should be able to get four wins in the last seven games regardless. So San Jose is riding a five-game losing streak. I believe they're longest of the season. So, I mean, a good team generally doesn't lose for that long, but I think it's going to, I think, last. I mean, they're playing Detroit tonight. I bet Detroit beats them. I think they're going to have a rough week coming into the Calgary game. Yeah. And, like, if, say, the Flames beat L.A., which they're currently trailing, but they're walking all over the Kings, so it's just a matter of time before they beat Jack Campbell, um, that, that they, if that happens and Detroit wins, then the number is down to two, and it's basically game over at that point. So it's just more nice to see that the Flames are getting it to the point where they can put the Y by their name instead of the X sooner than later. No, I agree. And I think, you know, as you were saying, the earlier we can the earlier we can lock this up, the better. And you and I talked before we started the show tonight. I think as soon as the Flames lock this up, we see a lot of guys sit. I mean, we talked about how good Maja Penny looks. What do you think of seeing him as the first line winger next week? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, if Calgary can clinch by the San Jose game... Or even the g day after against LA, then they can rest everybody on the trip to the Honda Center and call up a couple guys from Stockton. Well, the nice thing is we're in California. Stockton's nice and close. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> if they can get everything wrapped up nice and easy, then it allows everybody who ha might have any bumps and bruises some time to sit. Josh Healy is your second pairing defenseman. Well, bring up Valimaki back up, have Shillington play. With Matt Taramina. Yeah. Stone up it and in the lineup. So, you know, go yeah, with I, an I, go with an all star. Some guys to, banged up, and I think that, you know, the more we can rest those guys, the better we're gonna be for the playoffs. Exactly. And like that's why I've been a huge proponent of having Smith and Riddick splitting most of the games. Uh, Riddick isn't playing tonight due to being sick, but it, having each guy getting some action and some time off allows each guy to be fresh when the playoffs happen. And if they're both playing well once the postseason begins, then that just leaves a lot of options once game one begins. You'll see the coaches scrum before the game being like an NFL-style coin toss. Okay, boys. Call it in the air. That's right. Oh. Smitty, you get heads because you have better hair. Riddick, you get tails. Let's see what happens. <clears throat> Who's your starter tonight, coach? Ah, Riddick, it's tails. <clears throat> um, just wanted to point out an interesting stat here. The last time the Calgary Flames got over 100 points was, as we mentioned, the 2005-2006 season right after the lockout. And um, this year they were first in what was then the Northwest Division and ended up losing in the conference finals round one, or sorry, the conference quarterfinals round one in seven games, the Mighty Ducks. And I think that's where our Mighty Ducks woes started. No, our, the Flames have sucked in Anaheim since the year 2000. Yeah, but I uh, mean, as far as being our, like our playoff nemesis. Yeah, well, the Flames were kind of terrible pretty much right through Anaheim's entire existence. Yeah, so I mean, they didn't qualify it, it, for the playoffs from 96 through 2003. Yeah, and the Ducks were good then, and yeah, so it, it's one of those things. I think the Flames have only won in Anaheim seven or eight times, which is ridiculous because it's been like 25 <laughs> years and they're in our division. Well, here's but, the interesting yeah. list. Since that season when we went to the 0-4 Finals, can you name all the teams that have knocked us out of the playoffs? Uh, Anaheim, San Jose, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Anaheim, Anaheim. Yep. 
So in uh, 04, as we know, it was the Lightning that knocked us out in the finals. In 05, 06, it was the Mighty Ducks in round one. 06, 07, it was the Red Wings in round one. 07, 08, it was the Sharks in round one. 08, 09, it was the Blackhawks in round one. Then we went on a crappy run there. We're in 09, 010, 010, 11, 11, 12, 12, 13, 13, 14. We didn't qualify for the playoffs. 14, 15, we won the first round against the Canucks and lost 4 to 1 to the Ducks in round two. Uh, last year, or 2015, 16, didn't qualify. Then lost again in the first round to the Ducks. That was the sweep in 16, 17. And as we know, last year didn't qualify. So, yep. based on the history, it's our turn to lose the Ducks again. Well, we don't face them in the playoffs this year, so yay, awesome. I'm just <laughs> looking here. That yeah, the only other team that we might face is the Sharks, and they they're one of the teams that have beat us recently. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you look way back here, and like we've played. It's weird some of these teams that don't exist anymore. We played against the North Stars one year. Um, yeah. Some some interesting playoff history, especially if you go all the way back to Atlanta. Yeah. So, yeah, and I see the Flames up six points, and it was we were talking about they need that that uh, you know buffer. And I said this last week. I think the fact that they needed a buffer really helped. I think that that's um, this team plays better when they have someone to play for. And I think playing to get that buffer that was the I think that was the big thing for these guys. Yeah, and the Flames need to just keep their foot on the gas and not get lazy. Like, make sure they get the why by your name, and then you can take it off, the rest of it off, and, you know, get ready for game one against whichever team. And, you know, right now it's looking like it'll be Colorado, but, you know, things can definitely change on the because seven, eight, nine, and ten are separated by three points. Well, with with all that in mind and looking ahead to the playoffs, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the Flames lineup is going to look like for the playoffs? We've seen some interesting changes to the lineup recently. We saw Zarnik slot in when uh, Neil went out, and Zarnik looked really good. Um, now we're seeing Neil come back on the back end. We've seen Stone is healthy, but he hasn't played much. Like this team's got a lot of options as far as where you could put guys. Um, let's go through this lineup, the two of us. I don't think you see any change to line one, Goudreau, Monahan, Lindholm. Nope. Barring injury, they stay the same. So we'll assume here that we're talking about a healthy team with everybody available. Yeah. Uh, line two, 3M, is that how you'd run into the playoffs? Yeah, same here. Especially if we're going to have home ice advantage and you can put them on whenever you want for last change. Oh, yeah, for sure. And you want to make sure that, say, the McKinnon line or the Ben line, that the 3M line is right there, ready to go. I could see potentially tweaking the Froleek winger on that line on an away game and breaking it up because they won't be as effective. But at home, I think you got to run the 3M line. Yeah. Um, then we come down to the third line, which has been Jankowski and friends this season. Um, we've yeah. seen Jankowski, Bennett and Zarnik for a little bit. We've seen Jankowski, Bennett, um, various different guys there. Neil's healthy now. Zarnik's look good. What would you do with that third line? Assuming everyone's healthy. Uh, that would be my physical bruiser line and Neil with Jankowski and Bennett. And I think that that their job is to be the disturber line. And, you know, like you have Kachuk being the disturber on the 3M line, but it's like on the next shift after the, those guys are out pestering everybody, then having Bennett and Neil out there to just give everybody a hard time will definitely help to keep the momentum going the right way. Well, and that's a team that's got some firepower too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And those guys could easily chip in goals during the playoffs like the, each one of those guys can score fairly well at a decent clip and i could even see them one of them being like the story of the playoffs type of thing uh you know like uh, all the teams that go deep always have There's some always the un unexpected yeah hero. like Devonte smith pelly last year like uh, i could see one of those guys turning into that i was gonna ask you about line. that next week but i think it's gonna be jankowski I was going to say James Neal, actually. Well, I but. think we're all expecting Neal to have a good playoff. Like, for yeah. what he's getting paid, he was brought in to be a good playoff performer. Yeah, I, I would probably go Neal, Jankowski, Zarnik there on the third line. 
Um, well, I I think that if Bennett is healthy, that you have to put him in there just because yeah, he is true. such a good pain in the ass <laughs> when he's going. And see, he, uh, at 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 home, I would agree with you. On the road, I would probably actually go Kachuk, Backlund, Bennett on the second. Yeah, line. I could see that too. Yeah, that so, that would be a decent option because that three M line is not as effective when we don't get to pick our changes. True, and Froley could easily swap in with. The, those two guys yeah as well so yeah that's a possibility yeah so i can see that neil jankowski and bennett um at home and then that leaves you with the fourth line so you've got zarnik manjapani ryan hathaway uh who do you sit uh, unfortunately zarnik is the one unless there's an injury or like they're struggling for some reason then like say neil just really struggling then you throw zarnik in for a game or something like that but um yeah, I just it's not really fair to him, but the, there's only 12 spots. And He's been the 13th forward all year. Yeah, and... If it, I were the coach, I would probably start Hathaway and put him on a short leash, and I think you would quickly see Zarnik move into that fourth line spot. No, um, it, you need the physical nastiness that Hathaway brings, because Hathaway can easily bring a lot of the things that a guy like Furlan did for the team and he he has that yeah i think if you've got that big nasty first third line though i can see them trying to make the fourth line a little bit different a little well, more firepower. pathway has 10 goals he can hold his own he's not bad yeah no i'm not saying he can't i just i think zarnik's a little faster yeah. and they might want that oh uh, that's why i think like if zarnik plays i think it's neil frankly that sits uh if they're wanting more speed from that line okay yeah i can see that and then you don't see anybody like dube getting a, a full-time playoff uh, spot then unless the flames run into like four or five injuries dube would be the player i'd play but it, there'd have to be a number of injuries before then i think you're gonna see all the older guys uh lazar quine um buddy robinson all those older guys brought up at that point to fill those those spots yeah <laughs> then on the back end we have a good problem to have let's jump to our pairings yeah uh, gee which of our 10 nhl defensemen do we want to play so i think we'll agree no change to the first pairing geo brody yeah i think that the top four is pretty much a given with no Hamannick change to and Hannafin Hannafin. Hannafin. yeah you, you don't touch that i think you have to leave anderson in the lineup he's I on agree. his way in on the third pair but yep i agree I, I wouldn't be surprised if every game is partner changes, whether it's Fentenberg, whether it's Stone, whether it's Shillington, whether it's Valimaki. I don't think there will be actually that much change. I think it will no? just be Fentenberg the entire time, unless he gets hurt, basically. I, I think that Fentenberg's so solid and dependable, and just you can throw him out there and you don't have to worry. And with the third pairing defenseman, nice surprise. yeah, you just don't need to worry. And when you're in the playoffs, having a third pairing guy that you don't have to worry at all about him being out there, he's like, you just pray to him, you know, just do your thing. Be a good boy, you know, <laughs> good Fantenberg. Now go do what you do. This, this team seems to really like Stone, though. I mean, if you look at the deal oh, yeah. they gave him, like, I can see... Just because he's so beloved in this organization, him getting that start on game one. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know if he'll keep it, but I could see no, them. No, uh, I think that you have to, because Fandenberg's done such a good job. I think that you have to go with the best guy available, and that's Fandenberg. And it it's unfortunate for Stone, because he can play. And like if there is an injury to any of the six, Stone plays. You think it, Stone over a guy like Valimaki? Yep. I think that Valimaki and Shillington don't play unless there's like two or three injuries. And I think that even Dalton Prout plays before either of them as well. See, that surprises me. I think that with those guys up there, I think Prout will probably be riding the pine the whole playoff. Yeah, I'd have him as the number nine uh, behind Stone and... So I'd yeah. go Stone, Shillington, Valimaki, and then Prout. I've, Coach made some mistakes this year in his own zone. I really don't know I'd want to put him in a playoff game. Yeah, you wouldn't want him out there for long. But I, I'd i have Valimaki and him being interchangeable. Uh, I, I would not have Shillington play a playoff game at all. 
unless like would the flames have like four injuries and they have to play him yeah i can i can also see in the first round if brody makes some dumb mistakes which we see him do from time to time i can see them quickly moving anderson up to that top pairing i agree um i think the back end especially is where i can see well, peter's and, doing a lot more line yeah, shuffling anderson reminds me a lot of nicholas chalmerson from chicago and now arizona um very much that same very steady kind of guy and i have even though he's a rookie it, and it is so weird that he is a rookie because he certainly doesn't play like it i think that he'll have that kind of respect where he can slot up onto the first pairing if need be in a playoff series and look fine like i don't he never really looks like he's overwhelmed at any point which is weird for such a young player but uh, you know i'm looking forward to seeing how he plays in the playoffs to see if he can manage to um like take another step forward in his development the other thing about Fattenberg is I don't know he's going to be back next season. Like, I don't know he would be the full-time number six. I'm not sure he'd want to sign here as a number seven or eight. Yeah, I think that... I think he'll like, go July 1st, for me, see what's well, out there, and then maybe come back later. Yeah, for me, the way I kind of look at it is I don't see Brody being back. I think that they're going to trade him for, like, a good forward. And I don't see Stone being back either. So, uh, with that, the, it will create one spot in the lineup, and I think Valimaki takes one of them, and Fantenberg can play both sides, uh, much in the same way Brody can. So, you could easily make uh, the third pairing Val Valimaki Fantenberg, and that would be perfectly fine. I'd like to see him back, I just don't know if he will come back. Yeah, and I think that he, you know, being on like the best team in the west and a likely cup contender like if all things are being equal in terms of money and that you're gonna play i think that he wouldn't mind the opportunity to win the stanley cup well but, and that's where i could see if if a team if we go deep i could see a team offering them more than they should because there's always that premium on guys that went deep in the playoffs yeah i and, i could too like i wouldn't pay him more than like two million dollars mind you i but, wouldn't pay him more than a million five yeah the yeah, that that would be. They're gonna have cap issues next year. You can't be throwing around a lot of True, money. True, I know. I agree. Million and a half to like in that. You know, he, he's decent, basically. Yeah, I, and, I can see some of the teams that are out of the playoffs, like even uh, you know, Minnesota and Anaheim, saying, you know what, this guy helped Calgary a lot. Let's overpay him a little bit and bring him in and see what he can do for us. Yeah, um, maybe I think that his... his first option would be to come back though, just because you're playing on an elite team. And I, I think the I Flames are deleting. I I would have to expect they're deleting two players off of their roster. So. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised though if it takes them a while to sign Kachuk, and they might not want to do anything before the Kachuk deal. Yeah, and he might go somewhere just because he gets a you know an itchy trigger finger. Yeah, could be. I, I'm. Yeah, I think that's one of those where like once the postseason's done, I think that one actually gets done right away. Because I don't think it's going to be that complicated of a contract. Because uh, like if we're interested and he wants to be back, I don't think it's the I don't think dollars are. I don't think it'll be complicated, but I think like the Goudreau deal, it might just it might be one side waiting for the other to cave. Yeah. If you remember the Goudreau deal, it wasn't until we started training camp, and he was like, "Hey, training camp's on." Called his agents and get it done. Yeah. True enough. Could be. Uh. I. Yeah. I don't expect Kachuk to be done before training camp either. Like, I think it's going to be, like, right down to the wire. It's yeah, just... I, I'm not worried about him not coming in in shape, though. Knowing his dad, I think yeah. he, he's going to come in in shape. Yeah. I just hope that it doesn't extend into the season. I don't think they'll let it. I think, you know, he's smart enough to know he's got to be here for the start of the season. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, look at Nylander and how badly he's played this season. Like, this year has just been a write-off for him and the Leafs. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, uh, frankly, the Flames just have to look at that and say, like, we need to get this done before the regular season just to avoid that kind of a situation. 
You were mentioned earlier about Brody probably being moved to the draft, and I agree with you. I think, you know, Brody's days here are done. I think we'll get something nice for him because there's always, again, that premium on defensemen that go deep in the playoffs. Yeah. But what do you think the Flames try to get back? Do you think they try to recoup picks? Do you think they're looking for a big forward? What do you think they're going to go for in that deal? I th- I would expect that they would try to get another top six forward. Like, the way I'm looking at it is the team kind of needs a second-line right winger. Like, Froelich's done a all-right job, and Niels should be doing better next season, but if they can get somebody that's a top-end second-line winger, then that would be awesome. And I think they're going to do that by revisiting that Froelich in a first for Zucker. Yeah, and I could see that. Uh, it just depends. And, like, if the Flames do, say, follow through on that trade, then I could see them just dealing Brody for picks or Trying to just various prospects. Yeah. I can see knowing the Flames and knowing how they feel that Brad likes to get his goalies locked up early, it seems. I could see them trying to move Brody for a goalie. That That could very well be as well. I think if you can get the Zucker deal done uh, pe- let's assume this is pending the zucker deal gets done you bring in that forward i don't think you need to go out and get yet another forward who's gonna no. have another big cap hit um i don't think they want to bring in another defenseman you're trying to subtract to make room on the back end yeah. so to me when i look at what the need's going to be this offseason it's going to be goaltending and if you can get even if you get you know somebody's hot backup um i'd have to go through the league and see who that might be but we talked a couple years ago about you know i thought Darling was going to break out. I thought Ranta was going to break out. That kind of backup who was behind a starter that just wasn't giving them a shot. Yeah. Um, Darling hasn't turned out well. I think Ranta's turned out pretty well. But yeah. If you can find that kind of backup, I think it might be worth trying to bring that guy in. And, I mean, we saw this even when Brad brought in Eddie Lack. Like, he likes to get his goalies done early. Yeah, and there are a number of guys around the league. And, like, even if they take the starter of that team like if you look at anaheim like when they had anderson and gibson they wanted gibson to be the starter and the flames were attempting uh, along with toronto to get anderson and you know anderson's a good goalie but he is not as good as gibson and i think that there are some teams out there that have that above average starter but they have that really dynamite young guy behind them and it, it'll be interesting to see it. Like Calgary, has I think the if they of... trade for a starter, though, it's going to end up being an older starter, and yeah. you know it's going to be a guy thirty-one plus. I think. Nah, uh, well, it could be, but I don't think they go that route. I think that they're because they kind of wasted assets on Elliott and Smith and a number of second-round picks that they. Could I think have if used. they think Riddick is the guy, I can see them going that route to bring in a stopgap. Yeah, and I think if that's the case, then I think you just go to free agency and see what's available at that point and not burn Brody for that. I could see them trying to get Robin Leonard out of Buffalo for Brody. Uh, uh the Islanders and uh, is that where he is now? Okay. Yeah, and I don't think so because of the fact that uh, he's doing so well for them. He's kind of emerged as one of the premier starters in the league. So I think they're other more than that. Th- looking at the league, there's not really a lot of teams that are going to want to part with their starter. Yeah. Um, you know, Anaheim's not going to want to. If you could get Gibson, that might not be a bad option. I don't want to touch quick. Yeah. No. Markstrom's not the guy. Edmonton's going to lose their starter. They already have in Talbot. Yeah. Um, you don't want to go to Chicago. Their guy's too old. Arizona uh, and Min- Here's a thought. Um, why not go back to the well and pick up a former flame, Laurent Brassois? If you want to go Brassois, like you said, there's better free agent options. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're going to trade for Brassois, I think even within the organization, you've got McDonald, you've got Schneider. Like, if you, you know, go with one of those guys, or even Gillies, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't think Brassois is the answer here. Yeah. I'm just looking around the league, and, like, there's really not that much of anything that looks great. Well, that's and... it. Like, teams that are going to want to move their goaltenders are going to be older goaltenders. Um, the only... Again, the only thing I could see if you wanted to go, and I'm not saying I would do this, but I could see potentially trying to dance with Florida to get Reimer. 
Yeah, and I, I think I, you're better I, to go free agent at that point. Yeah, and frankly, I think that you might as well just bring Smith back. Frankly, I wouldn't bring Smith back. I think at that point, even if you go free agent, you get like Cam Ward, you're better. Yeah. Oh, like that's the problem. Like you look at like all the lower end guys on various teams, and they all kind of are mediocre. Like guys like Cam Ward, like they all kind of just they're there. Uh, like one guy I don't mind too much, but I think who's become their starter would be Linus Ulmark from Buffalo. But yeah, that's gonna be expensive though. Yeah, like, there are a few guys out there, but... If it, they hadn't come back late in the season, I could see Calgary have gone to St. Louis trying to get Allen as a stopgap. Yeah, that's another possibility. I don't think they're going to do it now because St. Louis is doing so well, but I think if St. Louis had stayed near the bottom, that's the only guy I could see that might be worth trying to acquire. Otherwise, if I'm Calgary, I'd probably go out... I mean, looking at the goaltenders, I think the best one that'll fall into our price range is going to be Cam Talbot. Yeah, and I'd be fine with it's that. Not a bad choice. No. Penny uh, doesn't decide to stay with the Flyers. Yeah, like you just look around the league and like there's no real great option really. Like all of the guys kind of are just there. Like and like you look at a guy like Tampa Bay's backup Louis Domingue, like okay, yeah, he's 21 and 5, but he's also playing behind like the best team in the NHL. So you can't really use his stats at all because it doesn't make you know like he's just you know behind. i wouldn't necessarily go for this guy but again i could see if the flames want to bring in an established name i could see them potentially kicking tires on michael newverth yeah it i don't would, think it wouldn't be a number one but i think if you have him and riddick as a one two it might not be a bad pairing yeah I think you, I, you I might, think the acquisition price would be cheap too, which I think yeah. would be the good thing. I think it just a lot of it depends on how they feel John Gillies will be, frankly. And like I wouldn't even be shocked if at the start of uh, training camp next year that the, the two goalies are Riddick and Gillies. And you know that might sound boring, but I wouldn't be entirely shocked because like you look at Sergei Bobrovsky. He's going to be getting a lot of money. He's not that good. And like I think that whatever team signs him is going to regret it. And I think the Florida Panthers will likely be the candidate to, to do so. But um, And the next, the loser prize is going to be uh, Varlamov. Yeah, and that's a loser prize because Varlamov's not... <sighs> How would you say? Varlamov kind of reminds me a little bit of Vesa Toskala before he like went off the rails where like he's just there and like okay he's there yay but like he could just implode at any minute and i like, can I'd, see i, I can could see, see a team giving him a big contract and then him being like a complete disaster like he was in toronto and just vanishing after that I can see him being the right goalie for a team that's trying to push i don't think he's your contender goalie but yeah, like a, you, say like a team like Arizona where like they they just need a good starter. I you know, a good enough starter to take like that next step to being a postseason team. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a good fit. But for a team like Calgary, like it's just I think if if the Flames decide they're not going to do it by trade, which Again, I'm not saying as they should, but I think that that's the most likely thing to trade Brody for if we get the forward in the Fro League deal. I think they're either going to go after Talbot or Howard. Well, the Howard just resigned with Detroit. Did he? Did he yeah. resign? Oh, yeah. that's right, he did. Yeah, one year. So I think then Talbot. The, I mean, yeah. Talbot at the would list, be the Thatcher Demko is not a guy that we really want, and he's RFA. Yeah, um, New Verth is a free agent. Like honestly, Ryan I wouldn't Miller. even be I wouldn't even be that adverse to calling up Vancouver and seeing if Markstrom's available. You if know, they're if willing to do that though, I would rather wait till free agency and go after I mean if you're looking for a young guy like that, I think Jonas Corpusalo might be a good guy to go after in free agency. Yeah, I think that they're kind of Columbus is penciling him in as their starter, though. So well, then, then they'll probably let Kincaid go. Go after him. Like I think one of those two will be available. Yeah. Um, Linus Allmark's a free agent. 
uh, UFA at the end of the year. So if you want to go after him, don't trade for him. Yeah. Yeah, um, I wouldn't. I, even before he was drafted, I actually liked Linus Allmark and thought he was decent. So uh, I wouldn't be that opposed if the Flames did end up going that route. I don't think that he's going to be like super amazing or anything like that, but I think he could be a decent goalie in the NHL. Yeah, that's just kind of looking at what they need. I can't see him going on and getting two big forwards. I think either Froelich or Brody is going to net you a forward. The other guy, they're either going to try and move for a goalie or picks. Yeah. It could even be a prospect goalie they go after. Like, word thing in NHL, but they could go for a pick and a prospect goalie too. I can see him doing that. Yeah. Yeah, especially, that could be. Especially if you think McDonald's probably not coming back. He's a free agent. I think they'll give Schneider another go, but I don't think McDonald's back, so he might just backfill that position. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a number of goalies around the league that the AHL that are on the more decent side of things that are just blocked by a good starter. That could very well be. Yeah, so I could see that. And I mean, we're talking about NHL goalies here, but... It's very and it's possible. just like it's the like Flames, a second rounder and a goaltending prospect. Yeah, well, like if you look at like uh, Treliving was in on Matt Murray before anyone knew who the hell that guy was. So, and we did try to get him. Uh, I think the Flames offered a first round pick even before uh, he became the backup and then the postseason starter for the Penguins two cup runs. So, you know. It, I could see them go that route. That would make some sense. It just would depend on who it is and all that kind of stuff. I have one more idea. Let me just look at how much the guy's making. Not saying I would go this way, but Tree likes his veteran guys. He likes to go with sort of proven entities a lot. Um, not an, as expensive if you're looking for sort of a 1B. I could also see the Flames trying to trade for Dubnik. Yeah, that, that could be. Dubnik's 4.3 cap hit this uh, $5 million this year, 3.5 in 1920, and then 2.5 after that. Like, he's a solid enough goalie that if you're looking for a guy to compliment Riddick and you don't want to face, you know, free agency to see what's available, I think Brody would also be a good fit in Minnesota. That's a start. Well, then you'd have the, the Broden Brodeen pairing, and that just confuse everybody. Well, I mean, but if you look at it, Sutter, Dumba, you know, Spurgeon, and Brody, not a bad kind of top four. No. That um, that, that could very well be if they decide to rebuild a bit. Yeah. I That's actually, thinking of all the names we mentioned, that's probably the most likely, I think, if you're going to trade for a goaltender. Yeah. He said, guy over 31, he's 32 years old, but he's got, you know, his, his contract becomes significantly cheaper next year at 3.5, and then 2.5 the year after if you do have to buy it out. But an established enough goalie, that might make sense some sense for the Flames. Yeah, that that's not a bad option. Not saying I would want to go that way, but if they're looking to trade their way into a veteran goalie, it's not a bad option. Yeah. I would Cap hits four point three, yeah. that's about what you you know, that's still on the light side for a starter. Yeah, like you wouldn't want to go like all out or anything, but if the price is right uh, you know, you could even expand the Frolik for Zucker trade to include Dubnik in that if you really were wanting to go that route. So. Well, if you want to go that way, do a two for two. Do uh, Frolik and uh, Brody for Dubnik, Zucker, and a pick or something like that. I, I mean, yeah. they're supposed to be, what, Frolik, a first, and Brody to maybe Minnesota for Dubnik. Uh, Zucker and like a third or something. Yeah, and like looking at Dubnik's stats, like they're not awesome this year. Two sixty goals against and nine eleven save percentage, but you also have to remember he's playing behind Minnesota, so you know, and they're not very good. Yeah, if they, I, uh, you know, the more that I'm thinking be, about that now, that I'm, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. The more I'm thinking about it, I've never been a Dubnik fan. I think it's that Edmonton stink that I still feel on him. But Yeah, um, well, like if you look at it, like uh, the Flames, you could hypothetically include like Gillies in that trade or something like that. You know, so that way they have a goalie prospect coming back and all that kind of stuff to make it fit. So it that could be. That wouldn't be a bad like larger trade if that's how it ended up being 
Yeah, I could even see doing it without throwing um, Gillies in there. I think that there's, as you and I mentioned, enough goalie depth on the UFA market that they might want to shed the $4 million and use it to go shopping. Yeah. I think Talbot would fit in well there. I think uh, there's a lot of guys that could fit in well in Minnesota. Yeah, like if they swap Dubnik for Varlamov, say. You know. Yeah, I don't know if they'd want to pay that much, but even if they were to get a, yeah. an Allmark or, a, you know, um, like you were saying, a Talbot, um, I think there's other guys that they could fit in and maybe save some yeah, cash. Yeah, like that- there's a lot more options that make sense for Minnesota uh, being where they are than there are for Calgary where we are. Mm-hmm. Like we're looking for more of a cup caliber goaltender and you know the options are more mid-tier starter types and yeah. where minnesota could use a mid-tier starter i'm not they're kinda... comfortable putting dubnik in for say 60 games or starter but oh no look no at him as an a b with riddick might yeah. not be a bad option yeah he'd be certainly able to hold down the fort and i think he'd be a better option than smith has been and and i think uh, an that would be a acquisition cost yeah I I actually like that idea. So yeah, I, I mean, like you said, it's it ends up being the same team, make a bigger deal where it's, let's say it was for a leak, of our first, which is let's say you know twenty five to thirty one because we're gonna end up high, but um, for a leak, our first Brody and um, let's just say those three for Zucker and Dubnik. That's still a pretty good trade for Calgary. Yeah, I'd probably want a little something back uh, on top of that, like, say, a third or something, but... I can see them doing a conditional third if, you know, Dubnik plays so many games or something like that. Or re-signs or whatever. Well, he's, I, he's yeah, got whatever. a long-term deal. They're both yeah. long-term. Yeah. No, that, that'd be fine. I don't have it's a problem It's not a bad deal for Calgary, I think. No. If you can leave the draft with some, you know prospects and have your goaltending issue really sorted out before july 1st yeah you're in, actually you're in a good spot i don't even think the flames would need to include the first in that deal actually I like think i think we might have to f- chip a little prospect at them or something but i think you have to include the first because if you remember fro leak his agent was kind of mouthy this year and i think you're almost paying them to take our problem true like, I think you, know, you can get away with, like, including a prospect instead, though. We'll see. Yeah. I wouldn't be opposed to it's more the, first if it's, it's more the value. Yeah, it's more the value of Brody being more than Dubnik. So yeah. that, that's where, like, if it's for, like, in a first for Zucker, uh, that's true. Brody yeah, eats if... some of that. So I, I think, like, if you were to say, I think the difference is more Gillies than the first. Okay, so what rate. if it was uh, Brody, Froelich, and a third? That might be yeah, that'd more be a, that'd be acceptable. Keep your first draft one, two. Take a break in the third. We don't draft don't in even, the second, so I don't even know what we've got this year. Ah, I could see them pulling a second out this year. Yeah, we'll see. But I don't see the big blockbuster. Like we don't have the picks to do what Tree usually does the last couple of years and do some big blockbuster at the de- at the trade table. But I could see that deal with Minnesota being his blockbuster. Yeah, I could see it too. So, there, we've solved the problems, Matt. Yes, now we have to get Tree on the phone and say, hey, get to work. That's right. Quickly, to the bat phone. <laughs> yes. Um, well, maybe you'll listen to this on the plane. They got a plane ride coming up to California. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's I, I wouldn't... I, I actually, the more I'm thinking about it, the more I like that. Yeah, same here. Well, I think that's pretty much all we have to talk about this week um, as far as the week that was. Anything else that I missed? Uh, not really. I'm just looking forward to seeing how the last handful of games shake out and how the, the other teams do. Because, like, uh, you know, like you look at Boston and Toronto. Like, you've known that was going to be a playoff series since basically December. So, you know, it, Calgary... We don't really have any clue yet who we're facing. Dallas won tonight, so that they're less likely now because they're now th- three points up on uh, eighth. So, and Minnesota lost, so it's looking more like Colorado or Arizona will be who we face in round one, and I'm hoping it's Colorado just because 
they're not very good. Yeah. I think Colorado's got one line I'm worried about, but if you can put the 3M line out there to neutralize them, I think that we can beat them. Yeah, exactly. Like I, Selfishly, also a quick trip. True. I mean, not selfishly for me, but for our team, quick trip to Colorado. Yeah, and like you look at like the other teams, defensively, they're all very good. Like mm-hmm. Dallas is very good with Bishop and Nett. Arizona is very stingy, except for when they played us this season. And Minnesota has a very decent defense and goaltender. So, like, those teams I look at as being more of a challenge just because of that. Where, you know, like, a team can upset a top-end team if their goaltender or defense does a really good job. And you look at Colorado, and, like, outside of their firepower on their top six, they kind of suck. So, you know, and they play a very similar game to Calgary, except the Flames are better in every way. So, hopefully that's how it shakes out. And I'm just hoping that the series is a short one, if they, whoever they draw in round one. You gotta hope, right? Yeah. Because the fewer think, games they play, the better, especially in the too, second and third and, round. And we often don't think about this, and I was thinking about it after we talked last week. Um, going back to 04 and listening to some of the interviews from that team, one of the things that the guys said was hard was the just the change in both time and altitude between here and, uh, and Tampa Bay. Yeah. So one of the nice things about Colorado, I believe they're the same time zone as us. Yeah. And sit very similar altitudes. So, in terms of a travel, like when you, especially in those games five and further where you're going back every other, um, you know, fairly easy to adapt in that case. True enough. Because I, I remember the guys in in '04. I went back and listened to some interviews. Said that was a bit of a struggle. Yeah, and that makes sense. And like the fact that like in those series, uh, like they were playing six, seven games each series, like that burnt them out and you know if calgary can have a easy first round and say you know because you know that vegas and san jose are gonna probably be a six or seven game series they're gonna be beaten up each other so like if the flames can have an easy road in round one that'll make the second round a little bit easier because we'll be fresher than they are well let's take a look at the at the week ahead uh, the Flames have a preview of the trip that they're going to take to California. They're playing L.A. tonight, and as we record this, they're still down one nothing in the third, which surprised the heck out of me. Campbell must be having the game of his life. Pretty much is. I've been watching it while uh, we've been recording, and he's been standing on his head. We won't predict this one, but uh, Wednesday night, the Dallas Stars are in town for a 7.30 start. No, that's one of those weird 7.30 starts. Uh, Friday night, we have the Anaheim, the, I still call them the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, the Anaheim Ducks in town, uh, on Friday. And then the Flames make a trip to California starting on Sunday. And that's the game against San Jose that I think will be pivotal. And that's the first of their back to back. So three games, Dallas, Anaheim, San Jose. Um, I won the prediction game last week. I thought they'd win all three. You went all Brian Burke on us and gave us a conditional weird pick that didn't end up panning out. So... I won, so I'll give you my prediction. I think they're going to, even though we're not predicting it, I think they're going to lose tonight and then get back on a win streak and win Dallas, Anaheim, San Jose. Uh, I think they'll win tonight and lose to Dallas, uh, beat Anaheim, and lose to San Jose. So you think they lose to Dallas and San Jose? Yep. The two games they really need to win. Yeah, thereby frustrating all Flames fans going, oh no, they can't beat the playoff teams but yeah i Um, i don't know i think that they they're gonna like la is really terrible so like i don't see them not winning tonight like it it, calgary's usually pretty good at playing when they have a reason to play and i think in the dallas game they could come out and say you know what let's see if we can win the against these guys because it's a good sort of playoff preview yeah and that might lift them enough to win that game yeah, well, it's one of those situations where, like, every result is a good one in that game, as long as everybody's not, like, nobody gets hurt. 
uh, just because of the fact that uh, we don't really want to face Dallas in round one, so if uh, they end up getting the two points, then it makes it less likely that we face them in round one. So, yeah, it, if that's how it goes, that's fine. And if we can get the two points, that's awesome, but it's not like we desperately need the two points either. So, we'll see. I think that Anaheim game is a must win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't really think the Flames have too many must wins. It's like a like to win. If I think you it's can. a must win just because I think they might struggle with San Jose, so we need that padding before we get there. I agree. I think they're going to win San Jose, but I think they're going to struggle with San Jose. Yeah. Well, you got to figure that the Sharks are going to be desperate to get back, and you know they're going to be throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the Flames. So I wouldn't be shocked if they the Flames lost that game just for that reason, but. And then, and it's one of these weird NHL schedules where we see LA and Anaheim this week in our barn, and then we go next week to their barn. Um, so the, those are the other. We'll talk about next week when we get there. There's only two weeks of the season left, but uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be seeing these two teams again. Yeah. Which yay, yeah, the, it, very wow. exciting. The April third is an eight thirty start time. Yeah, so it's a yeah. late game. Yeah, it's gonna be yeah. past my bedtime. That's mid-afternoon to me. No. <laughs> I mean, but if you think about it, that's going to be like a, a midnight finish. Yeah, I know. It's bizarre. The Flames seem to have one of those every year and when they go to eat on the West Coast. And it it's not so bad for us because, like, it's only an hour and a half. But, like, can you imagine, like, say, a Toronto <laughs> having to deal with that? Like, Well, I don't know how many people in Toronto are going to want to watch Calgary Anaheim. Yeah. So they're probably okay, but that's no. I mean, like if I mean, like if Toronto had to go to Anaheim and play a game under that, you know, like it would really. The league tends to baby Toronto's schedule. I don't think that would happen. True. Toronto also wouldn't have the kind of road schedule Calgary had this year. Yeah. What you mean the twenty-seven thousand kilometers that they traveled in February? That's a lot of air miles, my friend. Yep. Frequent flyer miles. Well, I think that's it for us this week. Uh, we will see you next week, and we'll see. I think the big uh, discussion on next week's show is going to be Sunday's game and how we do against San Jose. Hopefully we see a why by our next recording. And what does why mean for everyone that doesn't know? Conference champion. There's three letters you see on the score sheet. Why is conference champion? What's X? Uh, you're in the playoffs, and Z is you're the President's Trophy winner. So Edmonton should rename themselves YXZ Edmonton Oilers. Why? Well, because then it looks like they've won everything every year. Ah. Uh, Just yes. rename the team YXZ lowercase and then Edmonton Oilers. That way it's like, wow, we haven't even played a game. Presence Trophy winners right there. Yep. <laughs> or Ottawa could do it. YXZ Ottawa Senators. Yes. All right, well, Matt, enjoy this week, and we'll talk Are they going to gonna hire the Iraqi information minister as their new head of public relations? Who's that? The Iraqi uh, information no, but I mean, minister. which team? Oh, either Edmonton or Ottawa. I think Edmonton has bigger hirings to make this summer than, than uh, you know, information minister. True enough. I think anyone that has any relation to hockey ops is gone on the 7th, the day after they play Calgary. Yeah, well, they should be. Like Gullison they, could end up being the head coach there just by attrition. Like everyone else is gone. He was in the bathroom. And they forgot to fire him. Yeah. Well, yeah. Realistically, like if it was me, literally anyone affiliated with the Oilers on the management side should be getting a pink slip on April 7th. Like management, it, coaching, even the Zamboni guy. Like if you have anything scouts, to do with the you hockey name ops, it. Yeah. Scouts, you name it. Professional development trainers, you name it. Everybody out. I'd fire the whole lot and get, like, literally everybody top to bottom new. The guy who runs the away penalty box, you're out. You didn't do a good job this year. Yep, exactly. Ice scraper dude, you're out. You didn't do enough of a good job. You know, that's that's right. the reason why, that you know, it's just like how the management blamed Tobias Reader for everything. It was that we weren't getting the bounces because you didn't scrape the ice properly. There you go. You're out. All right, Matt, well, enjoy this week, and we'll talk to you next week. As always, go Flams, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. 
This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.